Hello and welcome to this edition of the PMO Leader, Building and Sustaining Your PMO. I'm Derek Brownell, Director of Sales and Marketing for the PMO Squad. I'm your host today. We have special guests, Peter Walter and Nicholas Taylor here to talk to you about the ITM platform and how building and sustaining your PMO is important. Peter, handing it over to you. Well, thank you so much. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Please send, uh, put something in chat if you cannot hear us. Um, and welcome to our webinar on building and sustaining your PMO. And thank you so much to the PMO leader for having us on. So my name is Peter Walzer and I am with Blue Globe Group. I also have Nick Taylor here for um, ITM Platform. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about building, sustaining your PMO and uh, our kind of learnings and best practices around that. And as we go through this, if you do have questions, please <clears throat> put them in chat and we'll be taking a look at those as they come through and we get to the end of the chat, uh, the end of our talk, I should say, we'll start to go through those questions and um, address them um, at the end of our talk. Thank you so much. So what I wanna do is talk a little bit about the state of the PMO, where it is today, what we can learn from poorly performing PMOs. Um, I think that will be a, a good topic for us. I think there's a lot we can learn. Is there a path to PMO excellence? Then we'll talk a little bit about ITM Platform and have a quick demo. And Nick Taylor, my colleague from ITM Platform is going to give that demo. And then we'll have a few announcements and some time for Q&A. So without further ado, what is the state of the PMO? Well, perhaps a number of you have seen this. Um, the question is, are PMOs having a bit of a survival crisis? So there was a study published by the Project Management Institute or PMI, and it's come out recently that PMOs are potentially struggling to survive. Um, at least they seem to have short-lived lives in any case. So this was a, a paper that was presented at the PMI Global Congress, and it looked at PMOs across the world and studied in particular 403 PMOs that met the study's specific criteria. And what they found was that of, of 403 PMOs, 15% of them shut down within four years, 33% closed within the first year, and then 55% shut down in two to four years. So it's kind of an interesting or troubling um, report. So um, kind of getting deeper into this a bit. So for those of you who may have run across my, my uh, publication on Medium Blue Project, I've written quite extensively about PMOs and in particular, I go into this survey that um, it was a biannual survey done by the, the PM Solutions Research Group. And the, the most recent version of this survey, they looked at many different things. And again, if you look at the, the Blue, Blue Project um, publication, I'd be happy to direct you to, you can get to this in more detail. But if you just look specifically at the top five challenges that PMOs are self-reporting. Three of those five challenges of the top five are really concerns of inadequacy on the part of the PMO. So you have here 50% of the PMO self-reporting that their processes are viewed as overhead by their leaders and by others outside their organization. 41% that they're having challenges demonstrating the added value of the PMO. 38% that assuring the consistent application of defined processes is, is a bit of a challenge. So again, there were other challenges. You saw 42% organizational resistance to change. That's always gonna be up there. And then 35%, you know, a challenge getting 
um, project managers with adequate project management skills. But you could see, again, a, a plurality of concerns around really just adequacy. So what can we learn from these PMOs that are struggling? And I think there's quite a few of them out there because I think there's always a lot to be learned from things that we're not doing as well. Um, and what can we do to kind of improve things moving forward? So I wanna tell the true story of a dysfunctional PMO. Um, this PMO's name has been changed to protect the innocent, but we'll call it the Corporate Remediation Aligned Program Office or CRAPO. Um, and so I want to talk about some of the challenges that CRAPO has went through um, and really actually still continues to go through. And I believe a lot of these challenges are emblematic of really challenges that can be addressed um, in improving PMOs out there in, in the wild. So first off, CRAPO um, had a significant organizational alignment problem so, you know, what happened was, again, these were remediation projects that were out there and um, there were many concerns without the organ throughout the organization that they get the correct oversight. So what ended up happening was there were PMOs and sub PMOs and, you know, just a really complex and top heavy structure of how those PMOs would ca carry out their their existence. And that caused a, a lot of challenges, you know, certainly understandable that you would want to have oversight when you have remediation projects to address. But one of them, what ended up happening was you had separate programs sometimes for overall end-to-end -end projects. So imagine if you had, depending on the PMO or the sub-PMO that you were reporting into, a different project schedule just because of the organization that you were in. Um, so those are the kinds of things that were happening because end-to-end -end projects were getting carved up into little pieces and it really wasn't managed in a, in a way that kind of made sense because of that top heavy structure. You then also had um, siloed kind of management routines and reports. So that meant that depending on the PMO that you're speaking of, you would have uh, potentially different reports, different outcomes shown, different routines. So all of these things created a, a problem um, and again, didn't necessarily you know, give what was needed to the key stakeholders um, in, uh, that, that CRAPO was trying to support in terms of this PMO. So what could CRAPO have done differently? Well, I mean, I think this is a courage moment. I would say, um, CRAPO needed to just have the courage to create a simpler PMO structure that made sense and, and be able to justify that to its stakeholders. Um, they could have scaled down the number of distinct oversight routines. Uh, I mean, I think it's going to be hard when you have remediation projects like CRAPO did to do that, but you could have, you know, single or at least minimal oversight routines that are then the re results of which are reused for multiple um, management reporting to, you know, to different groups. So I think that could have been um, one of the improvements. The key thing here, I think, was that the PMO needed to center its efforts around supporting really the strong project managers they had out there to lead their end-to-end -end projects. And that's really, um, I believe, the key function of a PMO is to support those, those um, project managers, which, which wasn't happening a lot of the time. Okay, well, the other thing that CRAPO did was they made some poor leadership choices early on because there was a, a lot of um, urgency to get the PMO stood up there were kind of the usual suspects of the large consulting firms uh, that were brought in. Um, and, and these are very smart people, as we all know, right? I worked in, in large consulting organizations as well. I, I know, you know how good the talent often is. And um, the challenge is that these folks were not experienced in 
in running PMOs and running large programs and projects. And um, so this did not really help the situation. And then the other thing that happened was the PMO brought in what I would call sort of administrative types. I, I call, you know, sort of clipboard people. I'm not really sure why this happens, but often these folks are brought in to help manage a PMO and they don't have the same um, understanding of, of what large programs and projects will need. And they don't have kind of that, again, that, that mentality of, of coaching um, and really guiding strong PMOs. So that is what Crapo really should have done was you know, taken the time to get folks in with the right leadership skills, proven leadership skills in terms of running large programs and projects, in terms of running PMOs, um, really, again, helping PMs be successful in, in these kind of stressful situations is a lot of what good PMO leaders do. And then the other thing that they needed to do early on, which they didn't do, was they knew that they had some challenges with some of their PMO leaders. It's just not working out well. Um, they needed to remove those PMO leaders as soon as they could because they were going to really demotivate the PMs and did demotivate the PMs. And really, they also were going to impact the reputation of the PMO. So finally, I guess I would say, you know, the other thing, uh, one of the significant things is that Crapo, as I say, was a toolless wonder. Um, <laughs> They really thought that they could um, run their run their their PMO routines with PowerPoint decks exclusively, and you know, and then maybe some Excel workbooks for certain rollups for tracking certain things. They did have some standalone Microsoft project, but it was really challenging to get an overall PMO. Um, or program or even end-to-end -end project view. And it was hard to get a consistent view. And really this is, this is going to hit you again and again in a PMO if you do not have the right tools. So what again they needed to do, what Crapo needed to do was you know, take a, take, get together the courage to, to evaluate the tools that would match you know, what the PMO needed. And you know, this is, being talked about a lot now in agile circles, this way, the ways of working um, and, and you know, applying the right kind of software methods and methodology um, to the way that organizations are going to, going to work through um, projects. So that's really on the IT side pretty, pretty exclusively, but I think that same um, mindset can be brought to, to PMOs. And I think it should be brought to PMOs. You need to look at how is the way that this PMO is gonna work with its key stakeholders and the tool set should embrace that, should be able to embrace that or be uh, scaled to that. And then, you know, again, the needs of the critical programs and projects that you're supporting need to be supported by the tool set. Um, the other thing I would say is that, um, you know, Crapo just needed to stop developing their manual and consistent uh, program status reporting as soon as they could. and um, that, that just did not happen very quickly. Finally, um, as things got worse for Crapo, they went into this reactive mode. And, and this, this can happen when your PMO organization is sort of under fire and uh, not doing well, and its programs and projects are not doing all that well. And so what ended up happening was the PMs who had very busy jobs just running their projects and especially because they had to do all this extra stuff within their sort of siloed organizations, they, in addition to their project management capabilities now, uh, or, or I should say responsibilities, they now needed to um, basically be involved in weekly and sometimes even daily, you know, sort of emergency routines to, to generate these deliverables that were required to, to kind of, you know, stop the bleeding, quote unquote, um, in the PMO. And so, so that's really not a good use of anyone's time, but it definitely does happen. So what could Crapo have done in this case? Well, they really just needed to, um, I think, 
start to look at the root cause of, of some of the dysfunction and, you know, gradually start to make improvements to address those root causes. Um, it's a tough thing to do, but I think that's the only way that Crapo could get out of their um, sort of chaotic cycles. And then finally, again, if, if there are certain leaders within your PMO that are reinforcing, are reinforcing kind of chaotic cycles, then you just need to give those PMO leaders um, opportunities elsewhere outside of the PMO. So really that's the, the Crapo story. Um, I hope you were able to enjoy that. Um, I do think that um, although it was, you know, kind of talked about in a, in a, a sort of a fun way, um, it was not fun to be in that organization. I did some consulting work with them and uh, I know that um, they were not having fun, but I do think that there's a lot that can be learned from these types of situations. So is there a path to PMO excellence? After we've heard the Crapo story, is there a path to PMO excellence? I do think that there is. And I think it starts with, if, if any of you are familiar with Jim Collins, um, you, you know the story of, um, uh, you know, Jim is, is author of Beyond Entrepreneurship 2.0 and Good to Great. And you, you know his kind of, his approach to getting the right people on the bus. He believes that's one of the key things you should do um, in, in any kind of startup situation, any kind of entrepreneurial situation. I think that that applies as well to PMO excellence. And I think that's probably one of the first things you should be looking at. So getting the right people on the bus is key. Um, and you, know, you don't want um, the clipboard people that are, are often found in PMOs, and I'm not sure again exactly why. It, yes, it's important to have administrative management capabilities, to have financial and budget analysis capabilities, but I think more and more what's what's most essential in your PMO is to find people that really, you know, have a reputation for and have a skill set for leading and coaching skilled PMs and and helping them be successful and that that's their orientation. Um, and also they have to have been there. They have to have run large programs and projects and even been in turnaround situations and been able to, to, to affect turnarounds. And that is going to be the first step really, I think in, in PMO excellence, if you can get those kinds of people on the bus. The second thing is again, a little bit from from Jim Collins, um, I feel that this is essential. You know, the question is, why is your PMO going to exist? Why does it exist? And and what is what is it's going to be its reason for sustaining its life on for many years? Um, and and what function will it will it serve? you know, over time for your, your most critical stakeholders. Um, it's what uh, Jim Collins calls uh, big, hairy, audacious goals, um, or, or often referred to as mission statements, but I think it's, it's Jim Collins' uh, big, hairy, audacious goals, or BHAGs, as he likes to call them, that's important to understand. If your organization has, you know, big, hairy, audacious goals that they're supporting, why aren't you supporting those goals? Can you support those goals? That is the kind of alignment that you would like to have. Um, I feel if, if you're going to be a PMO that supports BHAGs for your organization, then you're gonna be successful and you're gonna to continue to be successful for as long as you wanna be around. Um, another thing would be what specific organizational challenges are you addressing? What is, what is the reason for you being a PMO and continuing to be a PMO? I think this is really critical. It's interesting um, reflecting back on the, uh, the PMI study I mentioned at the top of the talk. So one of the statistics coming out of that study is that only 38% of the organizations that were part of the study had actually established their success criteria as part of their PMO startup. So again, there's a lot of room for growth there. 
So finally, um, I would say the, the, the last thing to really focus on, but it in some ways is, is one of the most critical things is your tool set. So the foundation of your PMO, your day-to-day -day PMO is your day-to-day -day execution with your tool set. So um, there's, a, there's an abacus PMO term that I use as, as I talk about this in my uh, another PMO blog post on, on Blue Project. Um, I think you know what that represents to me is a PMO that's going to you know, disregard the idea that you should have a, a modern tool set and you're going to try and do everything like Crapo did with PowerPoint and Excel and you know sort of just you're not going to use tools. Um, if, if you're doing that, I think that's a recipe for an early PMO death. I really believe that. So I think again, this is a moment of courage that you you really need to embark on. Um, to find a tool set that fits your PMO's purpose and way of working um, and assess whether that PMO tool set can adequately support the most critical programs and projects that you're gonna be undertaking. So with that being said, I want to now call on my colleague, Nick Taylor from ITM Platform to give us a short demo of ITM Platform and how how ITAM platform can support uh, a, a tool set for PMO. Great, Nick. Thanks, Peter. Let me just share my screen. Sure. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Um, great, thanks, Peter. So in, in this section, um, I'm just gonna give you a quick example of how you could utilize a simple and easy to use PPM solution such as ITAM platform to sort of structure and manage your PMOs uh, and also touch on some of the, the points Peter made. Um, so just to give you a quick intro of, of ITM Platform, it's a, a fully featured project program <coughs> and portfolio management solution. It's a software as a service, so it's just accessed via the web browser. Uh, and its main strengths are its ease of use, interconnectivity and quick deployment, obviously being a, a SaaS solution. So ITEM platform works within the hierarchy of sort of projects under programs, programs under portfolio. And today I'll kind of go through that and work through that. Um, and it's all interconnected um, to ensure great sort of PMO visibility throughout the uh, uh, organization or the, the PMO. So to start with, I'm just going to jump into the projects area. And I'll just show you a little bit of how this would look within a solution such as ITM platform. And also just to give you a bit of sort of context or understanding as to where the data is coming from and sort of where the, the team members and project managers are going to be inputting the data, uh, particularly important when we look at programs uh, and portfolios in, in a short while. So this is the project area of ITM platform, and we've got a whole host of management tabs uh, along the top here for, for the project managers to navigate. So we've got our team area. So you can allocate all your team members, you can assign them roles within the project uh, to ensure that each team member is performing the, the correct role. And you can also give them a role per task within the project as well. You've also got a budget area, obviously, where you can allocate your, your top-down budget. And ITEM Platform also has some built-in calculations. Uh, this will be based on the, the calculations made in terms of resource hours allocated. We've also got the Gantt chart as well. So this, in this project I'm in here, new product line, it's uh, just a traditional uh, classic style project. It'll be the, the traditional Gantt, but ITEM platform also caters for um, sort of agile methodologies. We, we've got the agile Kanban board uh, instead of a Gantt chart in, in some of the projects. And we've also got risks and issues sections for, for risk and issue management for the project managers. And they can come in here and drill down into their risks. And in this area is where they can sort of input all the uh, data, scoring, you know, costs, uh, what's affected, who's going to be the manager, add mitigation and contingency plans. So all the data can be input for the risks uh, and issues in, in this section. We've also got uh, documents progress area where the project managers can come and input their progress reports. And finally, we've got a dashboard. And so you'll see within sort of ITM platform and other tools such as sort of 
the, the dashboard will populate all the data that's being fed into this particular project that I'm in. So you can come in here and uh, sort of scroll through and navigate through the different KPIs here. And these are all best practices, uh, best practice graphics and KPIs. Um, and yeah, this just gives you a bit of context when, when I jump over to programs now about where exactly the, the data is populated by the team members and PMs. So I want to jump to programs. And so the program area is essentially where you're going to be grouping all of your projects and services within your PMO uh, and grouping them by the same business goals and criteria that you, that you set up in your, your company. So as I jump into programs, it, it looks very similar to the projects area. You'll notice that all, all the sections within item platform uh, look similar. This is just to try and ease the learning curve and you know, ease it for new users adopting the solution. But here you, you'll be able to input business goals and objectives uh, and really align them to the specific program that you're working on within the PMO. You'll also be able to come to the components and add your projects and services that are part of or required for the program. And a nice feature of item platform for program managers or, or you know, PMO leaders is the strategic alignment functionality. So this just provides the, the opportunity to you know, score and prioritize your, your goals and your projects that make up the program. Um, so I like to think of it as a sort of three-step process. We've first got our business goal prioritization. So essentially what we can do here is assign a value to each of our goals within the program and say, okay, which, which one is the most important goal for, for achieving the, this program? And so ITM Platform gives you a few different ways to do this. I'll just show this pairwise. So in this instance, we're just comparing our business goals against each other and saying, okay, which ones are more important uh, than the other? An ITM platform will also offer you a consistency ratio just to indicate whether you're, you're being consistent and you're not saying they're all more important than each other or something. And once you're happy with that, you can save it and move on to the next step, which is your components. So this is, as I've mentioned, all the your projects and services that you've included in your program. And the, and the same thing again, we're gonna prioritize these uh, I'll use this other rating this time. And so in this instance, we've got our projects on the left and our goals on the top. And we're just, again, going to score these uh, and assign them a value of which, which ones are more important to achieving which goal. And once you're happy, you can, you can save that and move on to the, the final step of the, the process, the component selection. So in this area, we can sort of kind of make the prioritizations. So we've got our selection of projects down below here. And we've got a few graphs, KPIs up the top here. Uh, so I just want to focus on this middle one, for example. So this is the efficient frontier. So ideally, we'd like our position to be uh, along the frontier. This is the most optimal position to be based on the value of our, our projects and the sort of cost associated with them. So the closer we can get, the, then the better the, the selection. So if I scroll down here and just move a couple around, um, maybe include some that are bringing a bit more value at a lower cost to this program. And so you can play around and just hit update charts. So they're, they're interactive. And you can see our position move. Uh, and yeah, this, this is obviously a better position to be in. So we're, we've chosen the most efficient uh, project selection for, for achieving the goals of this program. And this is a useful tool for, for program managers. Um, where they can you know, present their, their prioritization or their scoring graphically to, to management or PMO leaders. And once this has been approved, they can hit save and approve down there. And what this will do within the system uh, as it's all connected, once it's been approved, it'll, it'll notify the project managers that uh, these selected projects are, are good to proceed with uh, and they can start working and populating the data in those projects. So that's the, the program area I just wanted to briefly cover. And the portfolio area is the next level up. So this is where your PMO leaders, your portfolio managers uh, can get a high level view of everything that's you know, going on within your item platform environment or within your PMO. So if you scroll down here, you get a, an overview of all of your projects, what pro program do they belong to, and lots of data elements here, status, priority, type, assessment. Um, one thing to note as well within, with ITM Platform is that these data elements, status, type, um, these are all customizable. So ITM Platform is a flexible tool uh, 
to just try and really accommodate the PMO. You will be able to insert your own terminology, your own icons. Um, again, also really helps user adoption uh, as well for a new tool. Um, and so, yeah, this PMO, you'll get an overview of all these data elements. And if you did want to quickly grab this data, say you needed to forward it to a particular stakeholder, or you wanted to take it into Excel, maybe create your own custom graphics, there's a little export to Excel button here just to quickly grab that data, your portfolio data. Um, and that also leads me nicely onto the, the reporting. So Item Platform also offers custom reporting. So uh, as Peter, Peter mentioned in his talk, uh, Crapo's reporting wasn't uh, the greatest, uh, but with a tool like Item Platform, you can create custom reports, tailored reports, and essentially any data element that you can put into Item Platform, you can easily uh, take out with the custom reporting. Um, and you can also utilize Item Platform's uh, connectivity with its APIs. So we've got a whole host of open API documentation, um, just allows you to connect with any other sort of third party solution out there. For example, you, you may want to connect with a sort of top class uh, BI solution, such as Microsoft Power BI, for example. And this is just an API connection we've, we've created with uh, Power BI. And this is connected uh, in real time with, with ITM platform. And it's just showing you some custom graphics we created for, for particular projects. Um, and just, just an, an, as an example, just to show you how to use you know, its ITM platform's connectivity. And uh, it's, it's really essential for, for connecting within organizations and PMOs. Maybe they already have existing solutions, but you can use ITM Platform's API to easily connect to those solutions as well. And finally, I just wanted to touch on the resource management as well with an ITM Platform. So here we'll just be able to get a high level view of uh, all of the resources within your PMO. So you can scroll down here and you can either drill down by project and see exactly what resources or professionals we've got allocated to the project and what their allocation is as well. Alternatively, you can drill down by their professional category so we can see our engineers and we can see, okay, what's David working on? And you can drill down and see exactly what tasks he's working on, what, what the allocation is, if he has any additional availability. Um, and you'll also be able to see if there's any over allocation of hours for, for particular team members. Uh, and you may want to rearrange uh, the hours and the tasks for them. And I th think that's everything from the ITM platform side. Obviously, this is just a quick uh, session, but uh, I'm happy to uh, do another session in the future with anyone who's interested if they want to see it in more detail. But uh, for now, I'll hand it back to Peter. Thank you. OK, thanks. Great, Nick. Appreciate it. Okay, well, um, we've, we've seen a lot um, from ITM platform. What I wanna do next here is just go through, um, actually just says announcements. It's really just one announcement. Um, we'd like to let everyone know that we're piloting a monthly coffee with ITM platform. And so the idea with this is to see if there's interest in um, continuing to go through some of the best practices with using the tool um, and how it could also help solve for common PPM and PP PMO challenges. Um, we also, looking forward, hope to have success stories and insights from existing ITM platform customers. I always think that's phenomenally interesting to hear what people are doing um, with a tool like this. And then the other thought is we'd like to include occasional product roadmap updates from the CEO of ITM Platform. So um, that is our thought in having a monthly coffee with ITM Platform. Are there folks who are interested in that? If, if you are, could you please um, go to chat and just put your email address or a way to contact you um, in the chat? Um, certainly would, would love to see if this would be a topic of interest. So um, that's really the only announcement um, for the moment. We do want to look at some of the questions that we've had come through. And Nick, I'm not seeing any specific questions. Are you? Nope. Um, I can't see any specific questions. Um, 
yeah. just that the recording will will be sent out to to participants afterwards um okay yeah. yep is is there anyone else that, that has questions if you would put a quick note in the chat we'll try and address it right now um if you don't want to address it right now then also you can contact either nick or myself you can see the emails um, on screen and also we can provide those in the chat um oh good we did find at least one person who is interested in uh, in the itm platform monthly session okay so hopefully we'll get some more folks chiming in on that um I do have another question here. What should a PMO manager do if there's no real support from the C level? Okay, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, that is the sixty-four million dollar question. You, you've got to establish that support um, because if not, your PMO is probably going to be short-lived. I, I think it's it's a matter of finding out um, how you can, you know, build better relationships. With the sea level, um, and I think it's it's about demonstrating you know value first of all. If you if you don't have a well established level of um, support from sea level and maybe a minimal minimal interest, maybe part of it is figuring out how you can demonstrate the value you've already brought on. But I think that is is a key question. If 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 you don't have um, don't have that support, then you probably are not going to have uh, a PMO that's going to last beyond the statistics that we heard about. And um, the last thing I wanted to mention is that for folks who are interested, there is definitely um, a possibility that you can get, um, and, and it's certainty actually, that you can get a, a personalized demo of ITM platform. So if, if those of you are interested, in getting a personalized demo of ITM platform, can you please put your email in the chat and let us know and we can set something up. Yep, or alternatively contact uh, my email address down below there and yeah, happy to give any personalized demos. Yep, okay. Any other questions, comments before we close? Okay, I'm not hearing anything. So I think um, we are good to go. Thank you so much for joining our webinar on building and sustaining your PMO. And thanks again to PMO, PMO leader for, for having us on.